Welcome back to another episode of Four Down Territory. As always, I am Luke Easterling, your host. Doug Farrar of Touchdown Wire joins me as usual. Doug, how was your weekend of NFL football? Uh, better than yours, Luke. I don't. I, I I said that it was worse than zero and twenty six on Twitter, and I still kind of hold to that. Um, at least when the Bucks were zero and twenty six, they were supposed to be really bad. Um, I know we're going to get to this here in a minute, but oh boy, it's uh, not a not, not whatever the opposite of a victory Monday is. This is as bad as it's been for the Bucks in uh, in quite a while. So I guess we'll start there. I mean, the Bucks aren't the only ones, but you add the Packers into this mix as well. Both teams off to unexpectedly slow starts. They're three and four. Both teams struggling despite having top three all-time quarterbacks, right? Defenses that have been surprisingly off the mark. Uh, and overall, really just two teams that were expected to win their divisions pretty comfortably, and they're struggling just to bail water at this point. I mean, between these two clubs right now, which of them has problems that you think look tougher to overcome, and which ones do you think will be able to manage things as the season wears on? The Packers' problems seem more fixable, Luke. You have a backfield with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Eventually, you think Matt LaFleur is going to figure out how to do that against especially too high run the ball. Uh, Aaron Rodgers' deep ball isn't what it used to be. That was a problem last year. Uh, but as far as a passing game, this could just be a waste year because general manager Brian Gutekunst thought he could get by with a below-average group following the Devontae Adams trade. And the defense could perhaps be solved this little fire under defensive coordinator Joe Barry's butt because there's just there are times when you know the players are making not making plays and not maybe in their best situations. Hello, not putting J.R. Alexander on Justin Jefferson because I will never forget how weird that was. With the Buccaneers, and I know you can speak to this because you run Bucks Wire, it seems to me that you're dealing with a quarterback in Tom Brady who really doesn't want to be there. An offensive line that has given him no help whatsoever. They're rotating guards in game at this point, which, what? Uh, a run game that wavers between inconsistent and non existent. And the defensive fall off has really been extreme. And I almost wonder if. I think Todd Bowles is a wonderful defensive coach. I wonder if elevating him to head coach has taken the fire out of that defense because when, no offense to PJ Walker, but when P.J. Walker lights you up, three explosive plays in the passing game in that loss, you've got problems. The Packers seem to be a good team with a few fixable dings. The Buccaneers appeared to me to be a team in major transition, and that's going to take longer to fix. That's how I see it from 3,000 miles away here in beautiful Whidbey Island, Washington. Uh, Luke, you're right there. How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, the Packers definitely feel like the, the team that's closer to ironing out some of those problems and, and pushing for a playoff spot. The sad part is, depending on how that division shakes out, you could have a much better Packers team as a wild card team going to visit the Bucks on the road in the first round of the playoffs because the rest of the NFC South just happens to be worse than the Bucks are right now. They're still in first place at three and four somehow. Um, but Tampa Bay has really just run out of excuses for how bad they've been, right? I mentioned it earlier, at least when this team was 0-26 in the 70s when they first started, they were supposed to be bad. This team is way too expensive and way too talented to look this badly on Sundays, right? You you go into a two week stretch where you're like, okay, they're gonna they're gonna iron things out. They got Pittsburgh on the road, who's lost four in a row. They've got Carolina on the road, who's got the worst record in the NFL at the time they played them, and they just didn't show up in both of those games, right? You barely managed to find the end zone late against the Steelers. You don't find the end zone at all against the Panthers. You get a late field goal to avoid the shutout. I mean. You get drilled by a team that's in fire sale. In mode. fire sale, fire right? I mean, the, the the last nail in the Bucks coffin this week was the kids at Christian McCaffrey trade, right? Every Bucks fan who's been following this team for a long time should have known right then that they were going to lose this game because they had one less excuse to lose it and in and, and the star player being traded away. The head coach is fired. We knew on the third play of the game, and Mike Evans said as much. Mike Evans said that one play doesn't lose you the game, but when he dropped that 64-yard oh, so touchdown – he felt the light go out of the team. He felt the life just drain from them already. And, and if that's true, that's a reflection of leadership, both players and coaches in terms of not being able to be mentally tough enough to overcome that and still beat a really, really bad football team. Because I can talk all day about the injuries the Bucks are dealing with and the secondary on the offensive line and all of these things. But so were the Panthers. And the Panthers went and put it to them with their fourth option at quarterback, an interim head coach, without their star running back. The Bucks gave up 171 on the ground. That's the third game in a row they've given up a buck 50 plus on the ground. And they did it to Deontay Foreman and Chuba Hubbard. I mean, there's just. There's, they made Chuba Hubbard 
up like Barry Sanders. There's like, just whoa. no excuse. The fans are fed up. Again, this is a team that when you renewed your season tickets this year, they made you sign up for two years to take advantage of this last Brady window and get people on the hook for next season. A lot of people deserve a refund after what we've seen from the Bucks so far this season. And again, I don't see a cure in sight. I don't see something Todd Bowles said it today in his press conference. We're filming this on Monday. He said, nobody's coming to save us. There's nothing that can fix what the Bucks, you know, are, are struggling with right now, except for what's in-house. And again, they've spent a ton of money. They've got a ton of talent. And this was the plan, okay? This was what, I know you've had some injuries. You don't plan for Ryan Jensen, your Pro Bowl center, to go down, or Aaron Stinney, your guard, or all the injuries they've had in the secondary. But there are still too many experienced coaches, too many playmakers on both sides of the ball for this team to look this bad. And I don't know how it gets fixed. Wow. Uh, well, I, I, the two-year plan is interesting. I don't want to create an auto sponsorship here, but let's just say that the ticket broker of your choice will be very busy in a Tampa area next year at this rate. It was it was fishy to begin with, but it sure looks really, really bad now. Uh, moving to a team that hasn't looked bad, uh, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, again, the only reason they're not in first place is because the only undefeated team in the league is ahead of them. Uh, but Dak Prescott returned to the field for the first time since week one, uh, and the Cowboys beat the Lions 24-6. Prescott's first game back from that thumb injury – I mean, he 19 of 25, right? 207, one touchdown, no picks, passer rating of 113.2. That's exactly the kind of game I think we expected from Dak, but did you see enough of what you needed to from Prescott to believe that he can take the Cowboys to that next level and challenge the undefeated Eagles and even the 6-1 and one Giants as the season moves along? I might be more afraid of the Giants than the Eagles at this point because the Eagles offense is like body blow, body blow, body blow. <laughs> Brian Gable is dialing up some really wicked stuff with the Giants. It's, it's So they got two teams ahead of them right now. Prescott was a bit hesitant at the start of the game, which is completely understandable. As things progressed, you saw you know, he shook the rust off. You saw more of the Dak you'd expect to see. And the Cowboys are facing the Bears in Week 9, so you know that, that's, that's your get-well game. Your other get-well game for the Lions – and the defense, which recovered nicely from getting rolled by the Eagles in week six. I don't put that loss entirely on the defense. Eventually, when Cooper Rush is your quarterback, your defense is going to break from having to hold everything up. I think once Dak gets back to his ideal form, I think the Cowboys will be fine. The primary thing that could keep them from establishing control of the NFC East is, you know, the <laughs> – the Giants have Brian Dable, the Eagles have Nick Sirianni, and the Cowboys have Mike McCarthy, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't disagree with that part of it, but then, like I said earlier, this is exactly the kind of performance I expected from Dak and really wanted to see for him, right? More of a game manager look, flashes at times of what he yeah. brings to the table that Cooper Rush obviously just can't replicate. This division is going to be a lot of fun to watch, I think, all year long, except for the Commanders, obviously. And back to the Cowboys. I mean, that defense is balling. The offensive line is, is improving, which is, again, a very important thing for that offense. Dak's got enough playmakers in the offense, both on the ground and through the air, to keep that offense humming. So I can't wait to see how that three-team race progresses uh, as the season wears on. Speaking of quarterbacks who return to the field and return to form, uh, the Dolphins broke their three-game losing streak uh, when Tua Tungavailoa. Uh, came back uh, for Sunday night's game against the Steelers. He was either concussed in game like he was in, in week four against the Bengals or out entirely against the Jets and the Vikings after that. But with Tua back in the fold, Miami beats the Steelers 16-10. Again, it wasn't pretty, but they got the job done. Tua goes 21 of 35 for 261. One touchdown, no picks. Should have had maybe four picks. Uh, a lot of drops on the on the defensive side for the, uh, the Steelers. Uh, but again, a, a passer rating at the end of the day of 92.7. Dolphins are four and three now. Can they be taken seriously as a playoff contender now that Tua is at full strength, or are we still doubting them? I want to check, Luke. I think the Steelers just dropped another interception right now. They the did. I just saw the ball roll past me right now. It was terrible. It was Levi Wallace uh, again. Yeah, Tua was hit. Yep. Oh, poor Levi. I'd say that Tua was hit and miss, and most of the misses, as we've mentioned, were on the Steelers' defense. Um Against a more effectively opportunistic defense, he may have put up a performance that I was wondering if he should have sat out another week. Um, and can you please, by the way, stop ramming ahead first into defensers, defenders as a runner? Because it's frightening at this point. I, cra I cringe uh, every time, said, Doug, and I think he acknowledged that after the game, too. He, he obviously got a talking to from the coaches yeah. on the sideline there. Yeah, I know I shouldn't do this, but I do it anyway. Come on to it. Um, he made some nice, well-placed intermediate and deep passes, which you can see his development there. Uh, helped ably by Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle blasting off against just about any defense. 
Uh, you know, if we get to the larger global, what does it all mean? The Dolphins are better off with two than they were with Teddy Bridgewater or Skylar Thompson. But I'm hesitant to put the Dolphins in the NFL's top tier due to their quarterback. Now, Tua gets a get-well month. Lions, Bears, Browns, Texans. Texans defense is, you know, pretty spunky, but those first three teams, ouch. Then the Dolphins finished their regular season's games against the 49ers, Chargers, Bills, Packers, Patriots, Jets. That will be the crucible for the 2022 Dolphins and their franchise quarterback going forward. If they can navigate that to even three and three or four and two, then okay, you know, you're in the conversation. If not, then we're kind of back where we were. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it was great to see Tua make some plays and be on the field and be healthy, but man, it was hard to watch a couple of those plays where he's just ducking, you know, to try to get a first down and, and trying to truck defenders. It was it was really hard to watch, honestly. Um, so he definitely had some oh-no moments, right? Got bailed out time and time again by the, the cinder blocks uh, that I think the Steelers DBs had uh, replaced their hands with. Um, but again, I, I just hope he's able to stay healthy. Really. I hope he continues to settle in, eliminate those kind of head scratching throws and moments, uh, that really could have led to a much different result Sunday. Um, but that defense is, is talented. The defense is fun to watch. I think they keep them in contention. If Tua is able to take care of the ball, I like the scheme. I like the way, you know, again, you talked about Brian Dable earlier. I like what Mike McDaniel's dialing up with that offense in his first year. Plenty of weapons to keep making big plays all year. They've just got to pick their spots, take their shots when they're there, and take care of the ball otherwise because I think the defense will handle the rest. Now to wrap us up, Doug, we're going to uh, the draft side of things, a place I live 24-7 and love talking about, as you know. Um, But both the Seahawks and the Texans this year have done something interesting, especially given their recent draft classes uh, before 2022. Mm -hmm. Again, teams that did not have a great track record in recent years of, of hitting on a bunch of different picks in different rounds. But each of these teams landed multiple impact starters in this year's draft, right? You could argue at least four for each of these teams. For Houston, it's been cornerback Derek Stingley Jr., guard Kenyon Green, safety Jalen Petrie, and then running back Damian Pierce, obviously. For the Seahawks, it's been both of those offensive tackles, Charles Cross and Abe Lucas, two guys that I know both of us were really high on going into that draft. Uh, Running back Kenneth Walker the third, cornerbacks Kobe Bryant and Tariq Woolen, if you could take either of these draft classes for a team you're running over the next five years, which of those groups are you taking? It's a close one because it, the Texans got Petrie, who I think could be the next Honey Badger. He's 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 like Tyron Matthew light, and he could be Tyron Matthew heavy. And Damian Pierce was obviously my top running back in this class, um, which is borne out on the field in this brief. Enemy. Number two. Number two and for me, Stingley but I love has, that pick. Yeah, Stingley looks like the 2019 LSU version of himself, which is the one you wanted, not the other one. So that's all great. But you could argue outside of quarterback that offensive tackle and cornerback are among the two or three most important positions in the NFL right now. The Seahawks got two plus starting rookie offensive tackles and two plus starting rookie. That just doesn't happen, Doug. It doesn't happen. Not in the same draft class, man. And Ken Walker, who you know has only started recently because Rashad Penny got hurt. I mean, he's as explosive and as efficient as any running back in the league. So when you have the same brain trust of Pete Carroll and Josh Snyder, who didn't get five impact players total in their last like seven right. drafts to do this, I wrote about it last week that you know ownership was a little more involved, and maybe it was time for not for them to be babysat, but maybe watched a little bit. Like, okay, we're not just going to let you do whatever you want. Um, I would give the slight edge to Seattle, but in both cases, I mean, kudos to Nick Casario for dealing with all the drama he's had to deal with, right. the Texans GM. And I know Jack Easton League recently was shown the door. That can only help. Um, but, yeah, both these classes, I'd give the slight edge to Seattle, but they, uh, you know, both those classes – incredibly fun to watch and portend well for the futures of these two teams. Yeah. Again, I'd, I'd be happy with either one as well. Uh, you know, you take Stingley in Houston as, as an immediate shutdown corner, the versatility that Petrie brings to the table. Again, that modern NFL defense, being able to move those safeties around, he can play single high, he can play in the box, he can play in the slot and the nickel. So I think the fact that he's making all these plays, Damian Pierce, we kind of expected him to take over that backfield. He has done that. Um, Green's playing a high at a high level at guard, but he could also play tackle. Um, a great class for them already, but man, it's just hard for me not to go with the Seahawks here. And part of it is just because, and I know we've talked about this, Tariq Woolen was my guy, right? I, I still don't understand how a guy 
comes in at 6'4", 205, runs 4'2", does what he does at the combine. Even with the tape looking really raw where you knew he'd have to have some development, I had him at number 58 overall. He went 153 in the fifth round. Right about the same pick, the Seahawks landed another uh, another corner that should have gone much higher a few years ago in Richard Sherman. Um, Stanford, yeah, guy, yeah, rings uh, a bell, rings a bell. But, I mean, I had Woolen at 58, and that looks low now. That looks low uh, based on how he's playing. But, again, that's just one guy. What well, we got Kobe Bryant, who's got four forced fumbles already this season. We've got Kenneth Walker, who had another, what, buck 60 and two touchdowns with another long touchdown run on Sunday. Um I mean, when you're able, again, when they drafted those two tackles, Charles Cross, I thought, was a steal at nine, which is hard to get a steal that high. And Abe Lucas, I loved as a plug-and-play right tackle. When you handle both of those positions in the same draft, and again, add everything else that they got in that class, that's that's the building block type of draft class. You've taken care of premium positions on both sides of the ball with guys who are making an immediate impact and are going, are, and should only get better, right? Again, we talked about Woolen as an example. He was a guy I expected to take a year or two before he could play the way he's played already through the first seven weeks of the season. Well, they brought that Sherman guy back as a consultant to help him. That, well, that was good. Um, the Seahawks are the first team – because it, it's not unusual to draft two or three offensive linemen in the same – select two or three offensive linemen in the same draft. The Seahawks are the first team since the 2009 Jaguars – to take two offensive tackles in the draft and start them as rookies from week one. That was Eugene Monroe and Evan Britton. Turned out pretty well both times. I think the the team before that was the Packers with Chad Clifton and someone else way, 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 way back when. So this doesn't happen. It's just unusual. And Seattle's drafts are always unusual. It's just unusual that they're unusually good right now. So, yeah, I'd, I'd give the edge to them. Well, that does it again for us this week. Doug, thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you, NFL fans, for joining us every week here on Four Down Territory. We will see you next week.